Ephesians chapter 5. I'm nearing the end here of our study in Ephesians 5 on marriage. Want to read for us again verse 1 and 2 of chapter 5. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Then we come to the passage on submission, verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. As we then come... To open up this text this evening, I've alerted us this morning to verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And I want you to see in verse 33 the ending here of this passage, of this, of this part where Paul is writing. He says, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Now these two words, reverence and respect, are the same in the Greek. It's the word fear. Let us submit to one another out of fear for Christ. And then also let the wife see that she fears or respects her husband. Now, these are then the bookends of this passage that Paul is writing. The bookends, I would say, is, is uh, putting a sandwich around what he said. The two, you know, if you make a sandwich, you have one bread at the one side and bread on the other side with everything in between. And so this is what the text looks like then with this idea of reverence for Christ and then pointing us again to this reality. Christ organizes in the way that God has created the creation to be and how it was meant to be. God had made the man and he had made the woman and he had given the woman to the man. The man had responsibility to care for, to keep the garden and to tend it. And he gave the woman as a help. And the structure in which God had structured the creation was for the man to be the head of his wife and for the wife to submit to her husband. But then we saw that something happened to that structure that God had put in place. And that something that happened was a wicked desire of the man and a wicked desire of the woman. The man wanted to submit or would rather submit to his wife than to God. And the wife would rather submit to the serpent than to her own husband. And so we saw here that God gives us each a specific and a unique responsibility and calling as men and as women. It's not the same calling and it's not unfair because it's not something that we impose on one another. It is something that our creator created us with. And so again, this idea then of submission, of submitting is under the heading, have reverence and fear for Christ. Have reverence and fear and submission for the one who made you and for the one who redeemed you. And for that reason, we are called to submit to the order in which Christ had ordered things. Restoring the husband as the head of the wife, the loving husband, the loving head. And restoring then the woman to her position as help. And so this is what we need to see, how Christ heals those relationships and how Christ is the one who keeps us then in submission where our natural tendency is to cast off these restraints 
where just like the nations in Psalm 2 that rage against the Creator, that rage against the one who sits in heaven, and we take it out on ourselves, we take it out on one another. We think that we can rebel against the Creator by behaving in a way other than what He created us to be. Just look at the world around. Men going around thinking they can be women and women going around thinking they can be men. Why do they do such crazy things? It is because they rebel against their maker. They're saying, in other words, you look at this, this thing that you have made, well, I get to decide what happens with this image that you have made. I'll decide. I'm not... You made, you made me wrong, God. You should have made me a woman or you should have made me a man. And you see, it's not just in these extreme forms that we say this. I want to bring it back to us, to our hearts, because the same heart's desire to rebel against the created order is found in each of us. We also have a natural tendency to say, no, thank you, God, you did not make me good enough. You did not create me good. But it's all your fault. It's so easy to point the finger, just like Adam did and said, this wife whom you gave me. We blame God for the things that's wrong in our heart. We blame God for the things that are wrong that other people do to us. And so we put the blame on God. But this is not how it works. This is not how Christianity works. Christ did not die because God was guilty of sin. And Jesus needed to pay the penalty for God's sin. Jesus came to pay the penalty for our sin. And so it's our hearts. It's our hearts that need to be put right. It's our hearts that need to be reminded of how God had made us and what he has appointed and what he has called us to be. And so we submit then and we must submit to the structure with which he created us. And so we see then in this brokenness of creation because of the fall, God has called Christ Jesus. God has called his son and he has made him head over all things in the place of Adam. Adam, who was the head over the creation, who submitted the creation to futility, as Paul says in Romans 8. Adam was the one who had the responsibility for the creation. And God had said, because you listen to the voice of your wife and not to the voice of God, cursed is the ground because of you. And so why is there problems with us? And why is there problems with the people around us? And why is there a problem with the world? Why is there a problem with the structures in the world? With the inanimate things in this world? Why are they also not right? And the answer is because man subjected all of this to futility. Man subjected this to futility when Adam submitted himself instead of to his creator, to the woman that was given to him as a help. And so Christ then is the appointed head of the church. And so then husbands are appointed. The only way in which marriage then can be redeemed, the reality of marriage that was created, because what we see is men refusing to understand how God had made marriage and created marriage to be. We reject that. We've been rejecting it for years by our easy divorce system. By our, we'll see how things go. By when you're at a wedding, you say, I hope this lasts. We'll see how long they can stand one another. Because we refuse at weddings to point to how God had made things and intended it to be. And reminding one another of how good God had made this. And to warn one another and say, be careful not to break what God has given for us in creation. But then also to tell us, when you break it, be quick to repent and confess. It's like the parents having to teach their children, when you break something in the house, don't be so afraid, but confess your Come and say, I've broken this so that we may put it right. Don't hide away out of fear and hope everything is, or, or 
think that everything is lost. But yes, know that you have broken this thing, but you have to come to the one who made the thing in order to put it right. But we're like the rebellious children who think, well, we can put it together and pretend like it was never broken in the first place. Isn't this exactly what we do with marriage and even God's image in us? You hear people saying things like, well, I'm not holy enough to come to church. Or I've been sinful for so long and I'm, I just need to put things right in my own life and then I'll come to church. I need to set things right before, before I can approach God in prayer. I need to sort out my life and then come to church. I need to do this before I can come before the Lord. Stop, people. We're trying to put broken things together ourselves and pretend like it was never broken in the first place. But this is not the message of redemption. The message of redemption says you take this brokenness to Christ because that's all you can bring to Him. That's all we have to bring. We come with hopefulness because of who He is. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, for I am gentle and humble. We come and we bring this brokenness precisely because we know who He is. And not because we trust we can put things together and pretend like it was never wrong in the first place. Because if we can fool God with those things, He's not God. He's just like you and me. Which we also often make the mistake to think God is just like us. God calls us out on it. You think I am just like you. But my thoughts aren't your thoughts. And you see, this is one of the things we also need to learn how to submit to. Not to submit to every thought that pops into your own head. Isn't this what Paul calls the Corinthian church to do? To take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. Don't let your thoughts run wild. Don't let your thoughts just go in the way in which you think your thoughts should be going. But say to yourself, no, 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 my logic is is twisted. My reasoning is twisted. I need to see how God puts things and start reasoning from the words of Christ and the word of God. Because like Paul says to the Corinthian church, we have things upside down. And then God turns things right side up. And we say, what's God doing? He's making it uncomfortable because we're so used to being like bats hanging upside down. That when God turns things around, we panic because we're like bats sleeping in a cave. And we're happy in that situation. And then God turns it around and says, no, this is the right side up. And then we say, what are you doing? What's going on? You see, we do this with marriage even. We do this with everything. When God puts certain things right, when God redeems the realities of marriage, when God tells us the husband should love his wife, and then you say, well, he hasn't been loving. Well, my wife hasn't been submit. Well, they haven't. Well, the way in which you thought you were going to save the marriage is by telling the wife to love and the husband to submit. You're trying to put the broken thing together and you're breaking it. Just like an engineer who would look at me trying to build a bridge, seeing that I'm making it worse. Because I know nothing about putting a bridge together. So Christ sees how we are trying to deal with sin. And we pretend like we can deal with it by ourselves. And then he sees us making it worse for ourselves. We cannot redeem ourselves by doing more of the same. We cannot save ourselves by doing more of what got us into trouble in the first place. You see, what got us into trouble in the first place was thinking 
that I am an autonomous thinker. That I don't have to submit my thinking to God. That I don't have to submit to His plan. That I can go about it my own way. Thank you God for making these wonderful things. And I'm going to play with them on my terms. And then I break it. And then I say, well, I'm going to, on my own terms, try and fix it. It's the same starting point. When we only make reference to ourselves, forgetting the Creator who made us, we also forget that He is the Redeemer, willing to put things right. And we do more of the same, only breaking things. And then you ask the question, well, why is the world so broken to this extent? I mean, you all watch the news. You all see how ESCOM is broken, how the government is broken. Now all of these things are broken. And then we all have our ideas on how to fix it, don't we? Isn't that our conversations in the week? You know what ESCOM needs. You know what the ANC needs. We all have an, another solution. Which solution have we not yet discussed? Or which one is not very popular to discuss? Repent. Trust in Jesus. Jesus Christ has been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Everyone must submit to him. So be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that God is God and we are not. What does it mean? Be still and know that he is God. Stop. Bringing your own solutions to the table. What would that look like for us as Christians? That would mean we stop praying in this way. Like we so often do. Oh Lord, you should see the news this evening. So and so has done this and this again. And I think the way to fix it is if you would just please do this and this. Thank you. Amen. And then you say, the Lord didn't hear my prayer. The Lord didn't hear my I pray and I pray and it only reaches to the ceiling. Because that's what you aim for. You're not praying to God. You might as well just be praying to the ceiling. Because the person you're praying to with those kinds of prayers is not God. You might as well be praying to an inanimate object. Because the true and the living God already knows what's going on. And the true and the living God will tell you what is wrong in this world. You don't need to point out everything. It's like that young child in the house who points out to his parents everything that's wrong. That, that, that tap is leaking. That cupboard is broken. That thing, daddy, you need to fix that. Daddy, you need to fix that. And all the father wants to do is say, well, stop breaking the things. I fixed that today. It's broken because you broke it. Because you were thinking, you are going to fix it. Daddy, I fixed the tap and it's leaking more. You see? Isn't this exactly what's going on? We think we can fix things. But it's broken at a level which we cannot even begin to fix. If we continue in the way that, we conti that we've started. And this is why we stop our ears when God gives us the redemptive solution. Even when he points us that it is Christ who sets the example to love the church and who gave himself up. And he's calling husbands to do the same. And he's calling wives to be like the church, to submit to Christ. That's why we rage against it. You know, if we've already rejected the goodness of the Creator, what makes us think that we'll accept the goodness of a Redeemer? Again, that principle. That same principle. If you accept goodness from the Creator, you'll accept the goodness of the Redeemer because He's the same person. Creator and Redeemer. But what have we done? We either think of Him as the Creator or we either think of Him as the Redeemer, but never as the Creator who redeems. And 
It's as if though we don't connect the dots. It's as if we can't see that connecting the dots is a straight line. We have to do that funny thing where we first go wrong and then turn a different direction. But we see here that our submission also, submitting to Christ then, is a submission to recognize that His love for us is greater than my love for myself, or even my love for my family, or even my love for this country. You see, people often tell one another that we just need to learn to love one another more. Or if we would just love our country more. You can love yourself, your family, your country, but again, the words of Jesus from Luke chapter 14 he who loves father or mother or brother more than me. If you don't hate your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, even your own self cannot be a disciple of Christ. It is not more of our love, you see, because it's precisely our love without the reference of the love of the creator and the redeemer that got us here. You don't need more men in love with their wives. We need more men who love their wives, whether they feel in love or not. Whether his wife makes it easy for him or not. Because his call to be a husband to her is not based upon how he feels. Because the creator God had called you to be a husband and the redeemer God has redeemed the reality of what it means to be a husband. And so that's the question. What is our faith? What do we believe? And do we believe that God has redeemed that reality? And I submit to you by the divorce rates in our country. And if I were to ask you, do you think we believe this? Sadly, we do not. The world at large, we as a society, this is the air that we breathe. Unbelief. Unbelief. We're trained by the world to behave like unbelievers. When we submit to our own flesh, our own passions, our own desires, our own thinking, we behave like unbelievers. The question is, will we prove, like I said this morning, will we prove that the light of Christ is shining in us? Not for the sake of proving the worth of Christ, but to be found as proven servants, proven children. The proof is not there to validate God's message. The proof is that God would validate our faith and put a stamp of this is a genuine faith. God who points to his servant, have you seen my servant Job? Have you seen my servant Abraham? And then go read Hebrews 11 to see all the names of those who had faith. And then we discourage one another even when we talk about such faith. Yeah, we'll never have faith like Abraham. Never have faith like any of those named in Hebrews 11. Because that was then. There's no such faith in the world now. And then you have the answer to Christ's question. When he returns, will he find faith on the earth? Well, will he? It's an open question, people. It's an open question. Will he find faith? That should move us to pray, Lord, please, when you come, let it be found in me. Give me a gift of genuine faith in me. That I may be tested and found faithful. Again, this call then to submitting to one another. You see this call to submission and you see this call to faith is an individual call. It's for you. 
You don't lay, and lay awake at night worrying, I hope so-and-so listened in church this morning. I hope so-and-so responds by faith. Because then you're just passing the responsibility on and you're saying, Lord, all of the chaos in the world, everything going on, none of it's my fault. If only so-and-so in church would repent. If only so-and-so would believe. We even say something like, well, God, you can't expect of me to put anything right. But that's exactly what God expects of you. To repent and come to Christ so that Christ may fix you. Because the only way in which you will encourage your brothers and sisters is if you get up and come. If you demonstrate your faith, shining your light before men. But we're always looking for someone else to shine the light. Lord, if only you would have someone else go ahead and then I'll, I'll follow. But please don't, don't, don't let me be the first to take the step. That, that's too big of an ask. But I put it to you that every Christian is faced with this at one point or another in their life. Every husband is faced with this at one point or another in his marriage. Because there's no other man who's going to encourage you or help in your marriage. Same goes for a wife. You'll find yourself in a situation where the only place you can look to is Christ Jesus and his help. Where you cry out to God, help me. Because there's no other example, there's no other encouragement, there's no other help, there's no other person possibly who can help me, who can put this right. Only Christ can. And what I need to do is to submit to Him. And that's one of the most difficult things. Because like with any kind of surgery where the doctor tells you, you desperately need this. We often say, no, I'd rather not. Rather die than have the surgery. I'd rather take whatever, but I won't trust you. And we often do this then with Christ. If we refuse to come to Him to be healed, come to Him to be restored. You see, it's easy to come to Christ when we think he's just another faith healer who just lays his hand upon you and you don't have to go through the suffering of an operation. Because we're not, we're not uh, happy to hear that our sin is like cancer that needs to be cut out. We'd rather hear that it is something mystical and strange that he can wish away with a fairy wand. Gone. But Christ tells us this precisely because our hearts have been so infected by sin. The heart of man is deceitfully wicked. In, in Genesis 6, with the flood, God says, all of the thoughts of man's heart are only evil all of the time. That's the desperate situation of our hearts. We see submission then is a personal responsibility, an individual personal responsibility to submit and come and surrender to Christ and surrender to the way in which he orders things. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The submission then is saying, in other words, Christ knows best But also, I trust that as Christ had ordered things for the wife to submit to the husband and for the husband to be the head, Christ did not make a mistake. It is not as if the apostles got it wrong by reversing the roles and we need to switch it back. Because you see, once we do it with marriage, once we, once we tamper with marriage, we won't understand parenthood, chapter 6. Once we start messing with God's pattern 
in verse 22 to 33 of chapter 5. We start messing with God's pattern in verse 1 to 4 of chapter 6. And so once we mess with that, we mess with the role of slaves and masters. Refusing God's good order. I want us to turn to close this evening then to chapter 6 and verse 10. Because I want you to see that this submiss- submitting to Christ is a submission then as a soldier would submit himself to be trained in the army. Because this is the context in which Paul writes, to writing about the armor of God. Coming under the general, not just the general, but coming under the king of kings and the Lord of lords. The God who makes war. The Christ who is the rider on the horse, conquering, that we read of in Revelation. Verse 10 of chapter 6, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. How will we do that? How will we be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might? Only when we submit to Him. Only when we submit to Him. Because our strength comes from His love for us. The authority and power. Authority and power are oftentimes synonyms. The same Greek word translated with either power or authority. Power and authority, synonyms with one another. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. It is only by the authority and power of His love that you will be able to stand and be strong in the Lord. The strength is not a strength coming from you or me. It's a strength that comes from the love that Christ has shown us and the way to receive that, that strength and that love is by submitting. And you see, husbands then cannot bring in that kind of love in their marriages if they don't submit to Christ. Because they've cut themselves off from the source of that love. And so husbands, if that's the reality of your marriage, that should be wonderful news. To hear that. That the 10 years or the 15 years in which you were married unhappily was because you were building it on yourself. And finally, God has caused this marriage to be at the end of your capability and ability. So that you may learn then to turn to Christ and trust Him. And yes, it's going to be difficult because you've been married for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and you've not done this. So it will be difficult to learn something new. But it will also be wonderful in taking the yoke of Christ upon you and to trust Him and to see the redemptive love of Christ at work in your marriages. Because then we are looking to His strength and not our own anymore. Your marriage is in the place it is precisely because you've been looking at your own strength and not to the strength of the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The schemes of the devil. Scheming tells me he is planned, he is calculating. He thought this through. He has well laid out plans. To come up against the enemy with well laid out plans, you need an ally who knows his plans better. Do you know the devil's plans and schemes without the word of God? Don't think so. Verse 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Take up the armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. 
Isn't this a call for us when we look at the day in which we're in? Are we in an evil day? We're in an evil day. Take up the armor of God that you may be able to withstand. To withstand the onslaught. And what is it that we've seen is being attacked today in this present evil day? Manhood, womanhood, marriage, parenthood with abortions and suicide, teenage depression. These are the things that are being attacked. And these are the things where we think they've been given for our own comfort and our own pleasure and our own joy. But here is the wisdom of God. Look how closely the instruction to submit to Christ, for wives to submit to their husband, for parents to, 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 for children to submit to their parents, for slaves to obey their masters. How closely it is here to the instruction to be ready to stand in the day of battle. Doesn't this sound exactly like being conscripted into the army? A call to know your rank. And the question of rank is not how many people are under me. It's a question of how many officers are over me. Where is the places that I am called to submit? Submit to Christ. Submit to your husband. Submit to your parents. For there is one that is called to have responsibility over those under him precisely because he or she has submitted in the first place. How do you get from a lower rank to a higher rank? Not by being bossy. Not by being the main one or the one who's always right. But by being the one willing to submit in everything. The quickest way to becoming an officer is to submit. Be the one who's early when there's drilling taking place. When the sergeant is drilling the troops. Be early. And when he sent you around doing the drills and he says, are you guys tired? You say, no, more, sir, more. Those are the ones who climb ranks. Ask any person in the army. They'll tell you it's not the smartest. It's not the ones with the PhDs. It's those who understand structure. It's those who understand the unit is more important than the individual. And isn't this exactly what we're taught in the church? It is not about Jesus and me. It's about God and His people of which I am one. God fights the schemes of the devil more effectively. God is not interested in organizing a bunch of terrorists willing to blow up buildings. Can you see what I mean? How many terrorist Christians do we have thinking that's the kind of warfare that God has for us? All I need to do is run in like the hero and just take out as many unbelievers as I can. That's not Christianity, people. That's not Christianity. Verse 14, stand therefore, stand. Having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as the shoes on your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. You see, we need to be ready. We need to stand firm. We need to persevere and keep alert. 
And we need to keep alert precisely in these contexts. Husbands, wives, parents, children, slaves and masters. If I might summarize it this way. In your marriage, in your family, and in your workplace. That's the battlefield. That's the battlefield where spiritual warfare takes place. Be alert. Be alert. Because it's in these places that the devil brings his schemes to attack and to, to fight with you. And so we need to put on, stand firm, be watchful, keep alert, and know that in these things it's not for our comfort. My marriage is not mainly to serve me. My children are not mainly to serve me. My work situation is not mainly for my own pleasure. But in all of these things, we are called to be children of God. We're called to be soldiers of Christ. And this whole idea here of standing firm, stand therefore, and this idea of the shield. When Paul writes about this gear, what the Ephesian church would know of the best fighting unit at the time was the Romans. And I think you've, most of you have seen the pictures of the Roman soldiers, their shields, and how they made warfare. They were so successful because of the uniqueness of their shields and how they used those shields. Their shields was not mainly a little old shield to block for an individual. That shield was designed for the benefit of the whole unit, not for the benefit of the individual. If you were caught as an individual with that shield, trouble, because it's too heavy and big to you could hide under it but the whole idea is those at the front line holding their shield to the front and those standing right behind having, having it over top and those at the back having their backs turned to their having the shield so that nothing from the outside can penetrate into this unit and that takes discipline That's where the church needs to be. That's where we as a church need to work to realize that this is where we are in the battle and what we're called to be and called to do. Because we've all been laid ineffective by the worldly way of thinking that I'm a lone soldier. I'm the Rambo of Christianity. We should stop thinking this way. We should stop thinking this way. And it begins then by submitting to Christ. Recognizing His sovereign lordship over us. And also recognizing His plans. His plans are all encompassing. Because He's taken account of the schemes of the devil. Let's not cut ourselves off from this. Lord, let us not cut us off from his army, but let us submit precisely because he loved us and gave himself for us. And let us fight this battle in our marriages, in our families, and in our workplaces. Let's not think for a moment that these things are free from spiritual warfare. May the Lord help us. Let's pray. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, grant to us the grace that we would speak the truth in love, that we would grow up in every way into Christ Jesus, who is our head, and that in Him the whole body would be joined and held together by every joint, and that every Christian whom you have called into your army would be ready for the battle, to stand firm, to be reliable that we may, by faith, wage the good warfare, that each part in the body, that each member would be working properly, and that the body would grow, building itself up in love. Father, we thank you. We thank you that in holding fast to Christ, we have the nourishment. We have the nourishment 
of Christ Jesus who died for us and who sustains us and that we have unity with one another because we submit to him. There is no fabricated human unity here. There is no agreement on opinion, but a true submission to Christ which leads to true spiritual unity. And so, Father, we pray that we would continue to maintain this unity of the faith, that you would knit us together. Father, we thank you that as we belong to Christ, as we are the body of Christ, we thank you that we may belong to him. But, Father, we also thank you that we may belong to one another, that where you have called us to give ourselves to Christ, to submit to him, you've also given us a call that we may give ourselves to one another. And so, Father, we pray that we would repent of our attitude, of our heart that wants to take and take and take in our marriages, that want to take and take in the relationships that we have with our children that we wish to take and take in our relationship with our bosses at work and with our co-workers. But Father, may we shine the light of Christ in the world where we're willing to give, to give in love in our marriages as a spouse who knows the calling of the Lord, as a man who knows the calling to love his wife as a wife knowing the call to, to submit to her husband. As a parent to know how to submit to Christ to teach our children in the fear and the admission, admonition of the Lord. And for children to know their call to submit, to obey their parents and to honor them. May we do the will of Christ and so receive the blessing from his hand. The greatest blessing of all is to have your presence with us. Let this be the greatest desire in our hearts to have more of you. Let us not idolize the things that you give us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's now stand and sing our closing hymn. Our closing hymn is a call to holiness. We sing to one another with this encouragement, take time to be holy.
want to remind us that this uh, song where we say take time to be holy, it's not a pleading or a saying that take some of your time and just give it to the Lord. It's an instruction because we know that all authority belongs to Jesus. We're actually calling one another to take the responsibility seriously to make to take the time to be holy. It's not make time to be holy, but take time to be holy. And let's pray for the Lord to be with us. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen.